Hello, everybody. Did you have a nice lunch? Enjoy the food? All right. So I want to present you our next speakers. Uh, generally, they will talk about uh, Debian-based Linux distribution for smart for smartphones. Sorry, smartphones. And the idea is to show uh, their project and uh, the current state where they are actually right now, and what are the future plans. So please welcome Marilyn Wire and Ivan Chelinchich. Thank you. So, um, briefly, we'll uh, discuss uh, what Memo LST is and why. Um, the history of Memo, uh, what Nokia did, how we came to this point. Uh, we will uh, illustrate how, how we develop and how it's actually really simple to help out if you want to help out. Um, we'll look at the current status of the software and support for various devices. Um, and our, our future plans and milestones. And we brought some devices that are hopefully uh, the battery will last through the presentation. <laughs> and you can check them out uh, after the presentation. <coughs> so first of all, uh, our project is called uh, Memo Leste, just as the, the title of the presentation. Um, it's a mobile OS for phones and tablets. It's based on Dev1. And Dev1 is uh, based on Debian, but basically it's Debian without systemd, basically. Um, and we are using the latest uh, stable release from, from, uh, from Dev1. But basically you have all the packages from, from Debian that don't directly depend on systemd. Um, and we only work with uh, Linux directly from Linux store fault, so there are no old vendor kernels from Android that are poorly supported or have awful security bugs. Uh, for a few devices, we have some extra patches to make, for example, 3D acceleration work. Um, in general, we aim to provide a real uh, Linux phone. So it's a phone, and you can call with it, but just like the original N100, which we'll get to in a bit, you can actually use SSH. Uh, you have a normal uh, Debian package manager. Everything that's in Debian, you have it on your phone. Uh, not everything will work easily, because certain UIs are just not made for, for mobile usage. Um, but yeah, so you get the freedom, the hackability, and maybe some bugs as well. Uh, we're currently in the pre-alpha stage, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work yet. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that as well. So I've given some reasons on, on, on why to do this. Why would you want a phone that you can use to call and also uh, just mainly use as a Linux machine? Uh, the other reason is uh, partially just nostalgia. So I think in 2007 or 8, Nokia made their N900 phone, which uh, was uh, in a line of their internet tablets. They had the N770, N180, N8010. And then the N100 was actually an internet tablet that could also make phone calls. So uh, that was pretty nice. But it's also very practical because there's still a relatively large community around uh, Memo even now, 10 years later. Uh, and they designed the mobile OS, they designed the daemons, they designed the APIs, and there's a lot of software available that the community wrote. And uh, we aim to basically be able to just take that software, recompile it, and use it in our OS as well. Um, personally, I never made the switch to Android. I have an Android phone, but I almost never use it. Um, and I think just having Android and iOS is probably uh, not good. We need more community-based OSs. And uh, as I said, it's open, hackable, not locked down. You can do whatever you want. You can modify it in any way. Uh, and it's not backed by any company. It's just us, the community. OK, so um, our OS is based on Memo from Antel, which is a, a uh, uh, they made for the N900, and they had uh, Memo, I think, Diablo for the N800, uh, N800 810. And uh, after the N100, they made the N9, and they used uh, Memo Harmattan, or they just rebranded it to Harmattan. But we took Memo from Antel and started to make everything modern, have it make it work with modern Qt, modern GTK, modern Linux kernel, modern components. Uh, but just to just, just, uh, go some years back, so the N100 was basically called the, the hacker phone because it was a real GNU Linux phone with a Debian package manager. You basically, I think most people at FOSDEM and, and the other events, they would have this phone uh, because it was really, really cool and you could just build something in Qt or GTK and it would just work. Um, some of the downsides are that not everything is open source, so quite some of the uh, core components were actually not open source. And uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But for the parts that were open source, you could mail Nokia, and they would send you a CD uh, with all the GPL software. Um, and Memo from Antel is still maintained by the community uh, using something called Community Seamless Software Update. And they are still uh, patching bugs, fixing security issues, um, enhancing the software, basically. 
And these two pages basically list the, the packages that are still uh, closed source. Okay, so a lot of the work uh, entailed porting the software from uh, older components to newer components because 10 years ago Linux looked very different from now. Um, one of the main things uh, that, at least for me, proved to be uh, annoying is that everything depended on HAL, which was the hardware abstraction layer, and it basically did uh, kernel events, power events, disk management, sometimes even uh, the, the state of your uh, keyboard, if it's slid, slid open or not, and all of that had to go because uh, HAL was no longer uh, in use. So it had to be replaced with UDEF and new power, new disks, input, input devices, and uh, gadget of for, for USB gadgets. Um, I'll get to some examples of, of uh, what this entails. And uh, MEMO was based on GTK2, and they had also a, a, a QT4. And those patches also needed to be rebased to uh, GTK3 uh, and QT5, which is uh, being done right now. Um, and some, some of the parts just have to be uh, rewritten. So some of them were just closed source and had to be replaced entirely, but uh, with something in the same spirit and the same API, so everything else would still just keep on working. Um, and the community has done, over the, over the many years, they have already done a lot of porting, and they've also reverse engineered various core components that were originally uh, closed source. And specifically for device support, one of the pains is also that uh, the X drivers for the display from many years ago don't work with the modern X, so you have to update it to the new ABI, and this can be uh, quite painful. Um, so let's start with the porting success story. Uh, one of the closed source components was the internet connectivity daemon. Um, it basically arranges uh, wireless, uh, 3G data, USB networking, um, and it it's, a, it's a partially a daemon and partially some UI components. And it was closed source. Uh, and uh, uh, someone from the community reverse engineered it entirely using IDA, and I think it took like a couple of weeks, maybe months, half a year. <laughs> So it, uh, I think you took the debug symbols and the binary and just kept on going until it, just the binary, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so there was a lot of work and at some point it started working and uh, the, the, the UI uh, actually looked exactly the same as on the old OS and the uh, connectivity daemon worked and one of the nice things is you can take the reverse engineered code and run it on the old ferment OS, see if it works right and then you know you did the right thing. However, when we started to, uh, to use it on our devices, uh, we realized that it actually relies on other Nokia components that are also closed source, that are also no longer in use. So uh, uh, WLAN Cond was managed the wireless connection uh, daemon. Uh, it managed wireless connections, and EAP was the one that did authentication. But they were also closed, or uh, WLAN Cond wasn't closed, but EAPD was. Um, and we basically didn't want to use them because they were really old components. So the, the sensible thing to do was to switch to what Linux now uses, which is WPA supplicant, but the entire plugin for ICD2 was uh, not using that, so we had to write that plugin. Um, wireless now works, and you can even connect to uh, EAP networks and secure networks, and the next part will be to work on the, uh, uh, the mobile data. Another success story. Uh, I'm not sure how long this, this one took. <laughs> a few months. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so the, the virtual keyboard is now something that works, and it's based on GTK2, I think. Uh, it's called an input method, and it has uh, two modes, a full keyboard, where you basically have a full QWERTY keyboard and some uh, uh, modes to switch to other keys. Um, and the keyboard that only has special symbols because some of the phones have a hardware keyboard and so if you slide it open you don't need the QWERTY keyboard on your screen, you just want a pipe symbol or some other useful ones. Um, this is now also reverse engineered and it works on our latest devices or the devices. Um, I think I mentioned quite some of the software we're using but just to give you an overview, um, there are some main most specific uh, uh, demons like the device state management entity which manages uh, running services, restarts them if they crash, a bit like what systemd would do I guess. Uh, we have the mode control entity which keeps track of uh, uh, the device orientation if it's locked or not, uh, those kind of things. Uh, KERECV which receives kernel events like uh, the USB uh, device is plugged in, should we now start the USB network gadget or an input device or whatever you want. And ClockD manages the, uh, the time. And a large part of the UI is called Hilden. It was, uh, 
Well, made by Nokia as well. Uh, large parts of that are open source. They are partially uh, uh, integrated in GTK patches, uh, Qt widgets, and a, a window manager as well. And our other parts that we are going to use soon is Qt5. Uh, so we'll be using the latest Qt with the, the widgets ported. And a Dbus and Gconf are also a large part of the system where basically everything is, uh, uh, everything is stored in Gconf for communications done over Dbus. Um, the, the, the connectivity daemons are ICD2 that I just covered, WPS supplicant is part of Linux, and Ophono is the, uh, the modern uh, daemon that should, call, that, that should arrange for uh, text to be sent and received, phone calls to be started and routed properly, uh, and also for uh, 3G, 2G, 4G data. And we haven't yet worked on a UI for sending text, but we'll probably have to hook up Ufono to telepathy somehow and make that work nicely. Um, I'm going to let Ivan take over now, because he'll, he'll cover uh, how we develop and, and how we set it all up. Yeah, thanks. So uh, we decided to use uh, GitHub for, whole, for keeping all of our packages in there and also some of our core infrastructure because it's easiest and it's GitHub, so anyone has an account, so anyone can contribute, which is something we want. We want more people to work with us, if possible. We have a bug tracker, which is uh, the GitHub issues, so this is where we keep our, our milestones and our tasks, and it's like our central place to decide what to do and anyone else coming into my Molester can just pick out any task and uh, start working on it if they want to. Recently, we also started a media wiki instance, so the wiki holds instructions on how to install the images, uh, instructions on uh, packaging, and also the status pages of all the devices we have. And our point of communication is IRC, which is the nicest and most useful thing ever. So feel free to join the channel whenever you can. We build our packages with uh, Jenkins. So as everything is on GitHub, uh, so we have the packages in Git. So Jenkins has a module or a plugin, which is called Jenkins Debian Glue. And it holds the entire logic of a GBP build package, which is uh, even <coughs> Debian now has switched to Git. Dev1 has switched to Git before Debian. Uh, in it's, uh, it's easy and fun. It's really fun to work with uh, these kinds of things because Usually before it was all uh, the SEM and the, all the sal uh, the Anon SEM from uh, Debian, which was weird and you couldn't get any package history and it was really hard to find sources. So Git is really useful. Um, Jenkins uh, has a master-slave kind of thing. So since we are using all the phones and uh, it's, uh, it's, those are ARM platforms, so we have built slaves and they're hosted on our personal hardware. The line is hosting a, an overdrive. It's a, it's a AMD ARM server, and uh, it's 64-bit based, but we have CH roots for uh, ARMHF for the 32-bit, and also some Olimex uh, boards also build ARM. Yeah, and as I mentioned, the packages are hosted on GitHub and uh, Git. Yeah, this I went through. <laughs> And uh, we build the images using uh, the Dev1 SDK. The SDK is, an, uh, is a short term for the simple distro kit, which uh, it's a kind of a framework designed to easily facilitate building derivatives of Dev1 slash Debian. And it allows you to really easily customize uh, any, any kind of base system. So even Dev1 itself uses the SDK. To, to build the, the base systems, but if you want to, it's, it's very easy to plug in your own software, your own files, any kind of changes you imagine. The core of it is, a, is a, also a shell script library, which is called libdev1sdk, and then you, you write wrappers around it. So we made three wrappers so far, which one of them is targeted to ARM uh, devices, the other one is live CDs and the ISOs, maybe even installers if you like. And the last one is uh, VMs, so you can deploy stuff even on the cloud and uh, run it in QMO, and it's useful for development. To customize it, you can, you can change those wrappers. You can change certain files in them, the configurations, the lists of packages, all kinds of things. But uh, I also introduced a concept called blends. And uh, each, of these, each of these three SDKs and their build processes have 
9, 10 or 11 functions. And at two points in the build process, there, there's like a pre-install and a post-install. So after the initial de-bootstrap, you can uh, do certain functions, maybe install some packages. And then on the end, just before packaging it, uh, just before compressing it, uh, you can just uh, add uh, any extra files you need or any kind of custom configuration. And the whole system is written in Z shell, which is a useful and nice shell with a nice syntax. <laughs> uh, so the one of those is the ARM SDK, and it's uh, it's I think even maybe the largest knowledge base of uh, of uh, of the way of building kernels and uh, bootloaders for for all, all kinds of ARM devices. So you can find scripts that uh, hold the kernel logic, you can find ker working kernel configurations, and we support all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of ARM devices. Even like in MIMO we're building the Nokia and the Nexus, we have also Chromebooks, dozens of uh, all greener kinds of uh, boards, the Raspberry Pi and uh, anything else. You can also use it yourself, even on your laptops, on Intels. So all the builds are done in CH roots, and if you have a static QMU binary, you can, you can also build it yourself. Or if you like to, you can also use an ARM server, and uh, it builds as well. So feel free to try to customize my molest at some point. <laughs> the VM SDK builds uh, QCOWs and virtual box images, which are also useful for development if you don't have phones or uh, if you just want to do something fast, for example, try to build a package or debug a package, maybe it's easier to just do it in a virtual machine. So you can, using the same way, you can just build a virtual machine. And it's cloud ready, so you, you, on DigitalOcean or OVH, you can install MIMOLESTA and use VNC, if you like, remotely. And uh, I'll let my line back to talk about uh, the status of all the devices, show you some photos and uh, how the things are progressing and further on. Thanks. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we're in a pre-alpha stage, uh, so we haven't even reached alpha yet. So uh, some of the things are, are working really well, but uh, you can't make phone calls yet, so some, yeah. We won't uh, call it a better alpha stage unless we can do a bit more. However, the following just works. So on devices that, for example, have a USB gadget controller uh, or a host controller, you can just plug in a cable and it will automatically set up a USB networking. So if you're developing, you plug it into your machine, uh, assign a static uh, IP, and you can just log into the phone and, and do whatever development you want. Uh, the ones that support host mode, you can just plug in a host keyboard and stuff like that, and it also just works. Um, the virtual keyboard should work on the latest images. Uh, I think out of the box after you reboot once. Um, wider should just work. Uh, audio on most devices should, should work. I think there's a, a lot of complexity in, in the end in audio. Um, I'll, I'll cover that a bit for the, at the device specific pages, stages, but um, at least in the N100, for example, the speakers and headphones, they both just work. And I think on all the devices, charging just works. So you, if you just leave it connected to your device, it will keep on charging. Uh, they all have a nice battery applet that tells you how much of the battery is still remaining, uh, how long it will take before the device is completely empty. And on our wiki, we keep a, a status page that shows uh, the, the status of various uh, other components as well. So there's various we are working on right now that are particularly important. Um, I think it's the main somewhat of a, what should be the most important parts. So uh, again, I mentioned Ofono before. Ofono is the mobile framework that I think actually Intel started working on uh, quite some time ago. And now it's pretty much what everyone uses if they are not using Android. Um, so at least on several devices like the N900 and I think the Droid 4 and the Nexus 5 data already works. So you can just plug in a SIM card, connect to the mobile network that you want to use, get an IP, configure your interface with the right IP, uh, issue a few more debug system calls to actually bring up the modem, I guess. <laughs> and then at some point it will actually work. But uh, as you can see, uh, the steps I just have to guide you through to just set it up, uh, you really need a UI to do this for you, and you just want it to, be, to work nicely. So uh, data works, but there's no UI to do it yet. So we'll need to write an ICD, ICD, uh, Internet Connectivity Daemon uh, plugin to make, to make it work properly. Um, 
at least on the N900, it's also possible to send and receive texts. Um, again, you'll have to do some uh, debug magic. So there's, there's no UI for this yet. The N900, we've also been able to start calling, and uh, someone else's phone will start ringing, but when they pick up, you don't hear anything. However, there are the people who have actually made calls work properly. It just requires you to set up uh, audio, rot audio routing in a better way, uh, which uh, again connects to the first point where actually audio works on the previous slide, but there's a lot more to be done uh, on that level. 3D acceleration is another difficult point. Um, the Hilden UI that Nokia uh, developed uh, uses 3D acceleration. It uses OpenGL ES uh, 1, and I think also 2, and there's also an OpenGL backend. But if you don't have any acceleration, the UI is very slow, because then everything has to be rendered on, on, on the CPU. And if you're using a very old device, it can take like two seconds before you see anything happening. So to have a useful device, you really need acceleration. On the N100, acceleration kind of works. Um, on the Allwinner tablets, there's something coming that should hopefully make it work nicer. And on the Motorola Droid 4, not yet. But I'll get to that in the, the other uh, pages. But the 3D acceleration kind of will keep on going on for a while, I think, because this is generally a problem on ARM devices on Linux. 3D acceleration is just very painful to get right. Um, I think all of the following things that, I've, that are listed here, so the accelerometer, which is if you're moving your phone, it kind of tell you how it's moving, uh, what the orientation is. Ambient light sensor, are you holding the phone towards your ear, or is it here? Because if, you hold it, if you're doing a call, then you probably just want the screen to be turned off and not touch something with your ear. Uh, the radio, so uh, FM bands, receive FM bands, and transmit over FM bands. Uh, Bluetooth, LED control, and GPS, they should all work at least on one of our devices, which is the N100. The Motorola has most of this. I'm not sure if it has a radio. Um, yeah. So the actually really cool thing about the N100, uh, it's the hacker phone. You can also uh, uh, transmit radio. So if you're in a car, you can just play something on your phone and then set it to like a uh, 90, 90 megahertz, and the, if you tune your car to the same frequency, then you can just hear music over your phone, over the radio. Um, another big thing is the, the browser. There's various browsers in Debian, but they're usually not optimized for mobile usage, and depending on the device that you're using, you might not have a lot of RAM, so then a modern browser will also simply not work for you. Um, yeah. So I've mentioned N100 a lot. I brought Two as well, so you can look at them after the presentation. It's generally in pretty good shape. It could be a lot better, but uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with how far we got in, I think, about a year of time. Yeah, it's about a year. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the device. It has a hardware keyboard. Uh, the, the resolution is, I think, 800 by 480 pixels, so it's, it was good 10 years ago. It still works, but uh, compared to modern devices, it's uh, very weak. It has a 600 megahertz GPU and 265 megs of RAM. So uh, one uh, quarter of a gig, uh, gigabyte. <laughs> um, it's currently running Linux 4.15 with a couple of uh, PowerVR patches. Um, PowerVR is the GPU that's used in the N900 and in various other devices around that time. And as far as drivers on ARM go, it's one of the most painful ones. Um, there is quite some support from uh, Texas Instruments who made the uh, uh, driver, but that support ended about five years ago, so they no longer release new drivers for the N900, so you have to go back, find the old drivers, find the kernel drivers, and port them to a newer kernel, and hope it kind of works. And it kind of works. Um, <laughs> I was surprised when it actually started working, because um, when you first boot the device, it takes about a minute for the screen to initialize. It will keep on running, it just doesn't show anything yet, and after that, it kind of works fine. The clock speed is a bit slow, but you, it's so much faster than uh, rendering uh, on, the, on the CPU. And we already have, a, a, I think, a Linux 4.18.3 uh, ready. I just need to test it a bit more and see that it works at least as good as this one. Uh, wireless works decent. It's only 2.4 gigahertz and uh, BG, so no end wireless. Uh, the touchscreen works quite good. It's a resistive touchscreen. The keyboard works fine. And uh, it doesn't do USB host mode normally, but at least the peripheral uh, works. And as I said, uh, speakers and headphones, they also just work, so the audio also works. There's more work to be done, especially when you're, for example, connecting the device over Bluetooth and you want Bluetooth audio routing to work as well. Uh, for that, we'll need to start using Pulse Audio. And as I mentioned also, the 3G data works. So Ophono, 
if you set it up right, you can just initialize the modem and, and it works wonders. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the M100. So this is the next phone, uh, the Motorola Droid 4. It's uh, a couple of years uh, newer than the N100, so less old. It features an even larger hardware keyboard. Um, and the screen is, I think, uh, of a slightly larger resolution. It's 960 by, by, by something. Uh, there's been a lot of work done by a couple of guys, um, somebody from Germany, I think, an American as well. And they spent a lot of time trying to make Linux work on this the phone as well. It used to be an Android phone by Motorola. Um, and now you can take a recent Linux kernel, and a lot of things just work. And I think they, they presented their uh, work last year at FOSDEM. Um, it's a pretty good talk, actually, about the hardware enablement and, and all the stuff that they had to go through. Unfortunately, I haven't done anything with 3D acceleration. And unfortunately, the Droid 4 also has a PowerVR GPU. And it uh, will take quite some time to figure out what the situation is, what the latest driver is, and how we can make that work nicely. Um, and the Droid 4 does have a host, USB host controller, so you can just connect a hardware keyboard or a USB stick or anything, and it will just work as well. And I think there's someone from uh, Czech who is working on the, the, the modem for the Droid 4, and he has uh, data working, SMS, and phone calls as well. I think there were some issues with incoming SMSs, and in the end, in the end he switched back to using the N100 as his primary device for now. But it's definitely uh, coming along pretty well. Uh, one difference that might be interesting is that uh, calls on the Droid 4 are hopefully going to be slightly easier than the N900 because the modem on the Droid 4 um, has various codecs, uh, codecs built in. So for example, uh, echo cancellation on the Droid 4, and they're done in the modem. And the N900 doesn't have that, uh, which is a, another a thing that we'll have to deal with. So if you make a call with the N100, the, the, the voice quality is quite bad. Um, because you need uh, echo cancellation to, to be much better. And on the Droid 4, that's, that's built in. Another thing about the Droid 4 is that the modem, um, the two modems are both on USB, so they don't have any access, direct access to, the, to, to, the, uh, to Linux memory. So if the modem wants to do something evil, they will have to go over the USB bus, and you can control it in a much nicer way than you can, for example, on uh, most other modems. So if you're a paranoid, and you want a really secure black box in your phone, but at least isolated from your memory, then the Droid 4 is a nice target. Allwinner devices. Does any of you know what Allwinner is? Because I can give some explanation. I see one hand. OK. So Allwinner uh, is a Chinese company, and they make lots of ARM system on chips. They are used a lot in uh, single, single board computers and in tablets, not so much in phones. And Thing is that they're actually something that works with the latest Linux. Um, they're really cheap. Many years ago, I think they were branded as the four or five euro system on chip. So I think for actually for for seven euro, you can buy a system on chip that has four cores, uh, for a, a clocked at one point six gigahertz, and if you add some RAM, you basically have a machine. Uh, there's a Bulgarian company, um, Olimax. You might have heard of them. I think the CEO is also here. Uh, they use Allwinner in quite some of their devices as well, and I can definitely recommend uh, uh, <laughs> them for development. They're, they're very nice devices. Um, yeah, so there's, um, th their product would be the Linux Inno uh, Lime 2. That's a, a pretty decent Allwinner device. It's relatively cheap. And there's a lot of Allwinner tablets. Um, basically, if you are going to search on, on uh, some of these, uh, like AliExpress or Alibaba, and you search for tablets, you'll find a lot of Allwinner devices that are just Android running Android. Um, these are also working. There's, these devices, too, are the ones that we support right now. You can download images for them, and uh, it should work out of the box. However, there's no 3D acceleration yet. Um, there's no power GPU in here, so that's good. <laughs> I think PowerVR obviously died some time ago. But there's a, a Mali GPU in there, which is made by ARM. There's a binary driver, which kind of works. and if really nothing happens on the open source front, we might have to switch to the binary driver. But um, we prefer to have a driver. For PowerVR, this is basically out of the question. But there's some work being done on the Mali GPU. And uh, we hope to utilize that in a bit. I'll get to that soon. Um, 
Again, wireless works, battery works, touchscreen works, USB host works. Another very exciting thing here is that there's a very large community around the owner devices, which is why it's so well supported. Um, and they actually reverse engineered the video decoding unit and the video encoding unit, so hopefully playing videos will be quite a smooth experience and it won't have to happen on the, on the CPU. Um, one note, however, is that the company owner in itself is uh, not really helping to open source things. <laughs> so as, as far as their devices go, they're pretty nice, but uh, they, are, they aren't really doing anything for, the, for uh, the support of these devices. And a couple of years ago, um, a guy called Duke Verhagen, he started working on an open source driver for the Mali, and he got quite far. He demoed it at FOSDEM, I think, five or six years ago, and then he got a lot of pressure from ARM and other people, and he stopped working on it. And last year, somebody picked up his work, and now actually on modern Linux, with some patches, you can at least have the 3D gears demo running. I tried to run our uh, Hilton desktop on it, but it didn't work yet. So maybe in a couple more months or a year, it will actually start working. So that will be a very promising target. And the extra cool thing is that there's a company called, um, I think, Pine64, and they uh, make Pine64 hardware, which is also all winner based and they're actually deciding to make a phone. As I said, there's a lot of all-winner tablets, uh, all-winner set-top boxes, all-winner single board computers, but there are no phones. And I was really wondering why are there absolutely no Android phone, uh, all-winner phones, but they, these guys are going to make one. And because I think they're going to add a hardware keyboard, and the general Linux support is really good for these things. So that will be uh, interesting. A much newer device doesn't quite work yet, as you can see in the picture, <laughs> is the Nexus 5. It used to be one of Google's flagship devices by uh, LG. It features a much larger resolution, a uh, full HD screen, and it actually has a working 3D driver, which is open source. So that's really cool. Uh, I just didn't get everything to work yet. Isn't the, the desktop kind of started, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't rotate right, and there's some more work to be done there. And there are some people in the community who are also working on the modem. So again, that's another reason that we're targeting this device. Personally, for development, I use a Raspberry Pi, which probably more people are familiar with than without Owner, and it works fine. So we have images that you can just DD to an SD card, no, just Raspberry Pi. At home, uh, I actually have a full HD screen with, with touch support, so that makes it for a very nice uh, device to just uh, uh, mess around with and, and, and test touch support. And it's fast enough that compiling things doesn't really take a very long time. So it has a working 3D driver. So that's a, uh, an open source working 3D, 3D driver. That's really cool. This is where uh, I did most of the work. After the, uh, the Internet Connectivity daemon was finished, I did a WPA supplicant plugin on this device. And uh, yeah, it's, it makes for a pretty cool demo uh, uh, platform, but unfortunately, the screen was way too large to bring in the plane, so <laughs> I didn't bring it. Uh, we were actually considering um, at the Hackerspace in Sofia in it lab, they recently got some kiosk screens with a, a touch support, but the touch support was so terrible it would just make us even look worse. But it would have made for a nice demo if it actually uh, was pretty accurate. Um, Ivan already mentioned virtual machine support. That's also in place, so if you have QMU or VirtualBox or VMware, you can just take one of our images and run it on your laptop. We do development on the uh, devices itself, so there's no SDK that you have to set up. You just put the image, log in, and work as normal. Um, and of course, with the virtual machines, you can also do pass-through of USB devices, uh, touch screens, this kind of stuff. OK, so there's um, We haven't even reached the alpha stage yet. We'll get there soon. If we finish up uh, QT5, then I think we'll release the alpha images. And once we get phone calls and texts to work properly with a decent UI, we'll make a better release, at least for the N100 and the Android 4. Uh, other milestones would be to make IPv6 work properly. Right now it doesn't, and <laughs> I think that's a shame because as a community Linux device, we should really have nice IPv6 support. And on the uh, GitHub bug tracker, there's a list of other milestones and things that we're working on. And generally, I really hope that we're going to get more people to help us work on this and, and finish, uh, <laughs> at least get to a, a decent stage. It's been uh, three people for quite a while, and recently another guy joined in. He's also doing quite some work, and I hope that in half a year, we'll have uh, a couple more people just uh, building software, fixing shit, uh, that kind of stuff. The Pine64 people have actually uh, sent us development kits for their phone. So uh, 
when I get home in about a week, I hope that it will be at home and we can just start messing around and, and make sure that it works by the time they're going to present it at FOSDEM. So at FOSDEM, they'll present the Pine64 phone. And basically, I hope there's going to be some other devices. I think the, the, Libra, uh, the Libra and people are making a Purism phone. Uh, we haven't reached out to them, but I think they're kind of doing their own thing. They're not sure if they're interested in other, other software running on their phone. And basically, whatever you want, because it's a hackable open phone, you can take it and do whatever, which is kind of the point. Um, personally, I want a different file system. We are using X4 right now, but I want to use BetterFS. And every time I update, I want to make a snapshot before I update so I can revert. Uh, I want full disk encryption. <laughs> because why not, and I hope we can support more than a few phones uh, and get a decent browser up and running. There's uh, a lot of things that we can do with WebKit browsers. Firefox, not so much anymore. Firefox used to be very nice for embedding, but they kind of didn't work on that for a long time. And another thing that I really like is simulation. So there's a project called Antbox, and it works out of the box, I think, on Ubuntu if you install it, and it basically allows you to emulate Android with containers. So it just set up, sets up an Android Linux container and loads the right Android uh, kernel drivers, and then you can just have WhatsApp or whatever other application in there. And I think it will actually integrate quite well in uh, the Memo UI. Um, yeah, so summary, alpha stage, but hopefully in a month or so we can release an alpha. It's already usable to varying degrees on uh, several devices. And we really need more people. Even if you're not uh, a C coder, there's lots of stuff to be documented, tested. The, the wiki could use a lot of work, uh, structure it in a nice way. That kind of stuff is also very welcome. Um, yeah, here's a list of various resources. And uh, yeah, so our homepage is on GitHub. We post blogs every two months, usually. Uh, our wiki is here, source codes on GitHub, bug trackers already mentioned. Uh, this is the memo.org website. It's not run by us, but by, by the memo community, which has existed for way longer. Uh, there's a nice forum there. We have some threads there and, and try to answer questions of people. Uh, IRC is the best way to reach us directly. And we have a mailing list as well that we're uh, going to start using more soon. And uh, that's it. Questions? Thank you very much. It really sounds like a really hard job, and uh, it, it's really amazing that all this is open source. All right, do we have any questions? We have enough time for that, so anybody? Yeah. How do you plan to popularize your project? Um, whatever, this is fine. All right. um, that's a good question. Um, in the end, popularity in itself is not a goal. So it would be very nice if it means that we get more people working on it, more people using it reporting bugs. But we don't have the, uh, the idea that we'll somehow have a 5% market, a global market share in the next couple of years, right? So um, I'm still using the, the old MAME OS myself uh, for Mantle. And I'm attached to it, and I like it, and I hope that in a few years I can switch, or maybe in half a year I can switch to MAME OS instead and use it as a, as a primary, primary phone. And I'm pretty sure there's quite some other people that also like that. So we hope to just give talks like this, reach out to people, get them excited, show it's not very hard to actually get a, a well, it's, it, it takes time, but it's very feasible to have a, a, a Linux phone. And uh, yeah, that would be a way to make it more popular. So tell your friends about it. All right, any more questions? Yep. You, you said uh, something that uh, made me curious. Uh, you said that the uh, purism people are doing the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, it's a different thing uh, for sure, but why, uh, uh, why do you think? I mean, uh, it's a different thing. I understand that. But uh, uh, it seems if they produce a phone, it will be a very good target for Memo. Sorry, can you just, yeah, if you can pick that phone because we have people on stream watching on. Ah, oh, sorry, this uh, mic should be, yeah, thank you. It's just for the people stream, yes, okay, yes. Sure. So, um, I wasn't implying there's 
they're doing the wrong thing because they're making an open source phone. That's really cool. Um, and I think it's good to have multiple community developed uh, OSs and they actually have money as well so they can hire people to work on it full time. So that's very different. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe they are open to sending us a dev kit and we can try to port it to their device as well. Um, so I, no, I didn't mean to attack them. I'm, I'm very happy that they're doing these kind of things. Um, I wouldn't also say that they're wrong for not using our thing. Because realistically, we're still in the pre-alpha stage, and uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Because if they produce the phone, it will be totally open. Everything will be open source. So mm -hmm. any of any uh, of them can uh, port their software. Yeah. So uh, you said just because you didn't have a mic, you said that they are making an open source phone, and when when it's ready, we can actually start porting our stuff yeah, as well. Yes, probably you mentioned Scarver. It's definitely is to to discover. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if they are, uh, so um, it will not be super hard for us to port it because if a device is generally pretty good, well supported by Linux, then the main challenges are the modem and 3D support. So for example, with the Motorola Droid 4, we didn't have to do that much work because uh, we're mostly working on the N100 and virtual device and if Linux support is there, it will just work, right? So uh, if, the, if the purism guys are going to work with mainline Linux, not, not a vendor kernel, then it then might be uh, relatively feasible for us to, to make this happen. One other thing uh, in this area that might be interesting to mention is that um, the, we are only using the mainline Linux kernel, the, uh, but it's also possible to take an Android device with an Android kernel and make Memo Lesser run on it, but we don't plan on supporting it because too much work. it's too much work and it's not what the community wants. Because the community wants <laughs> up-to-date software, not a vendor, vendor kernel that just doesn't maintain anything anymore. Uh, however, something we should mention uh, is that there's another project called uh, Post Market OS, Post Market OS, and they are not exactly doing the opposite, but they're also working on a mobile phone OS, uh, but they are trying to support as many devices as they can. So they are also supporting the i900 and the Droid 4, but they also support a lot of old Android phones. So if you have an old Android phone, you can go to their website, postmarketOS.org, and they might have an image for you that will use an Android kernel, but at least you can use it with Linux. All right, any more questions? All right, then thank you very much. Thanks. Just one more question for everybody. So in the workshops, instead of uh, having uh, a session on walk picking, there will be full contact Tetris. It starts now and you can go and try it. Today it will be with Super Mario. So it's gonna be quite interesting really. Thank you very much.